points of the integrable system, which means fixed points of that Rn action. Uh, these are also called rank zero points. Um, OK, so, so uh, let's start with sort of the toric case, which is the nice case we'd like to emulate that where things all work very well. Um, so here I have the definition of an uh, integrable system. And then the additional stuff we require in the toric case is that the flows of these uh, Hamiltonian vector fields are all periodic of the same period, which is to say that it comes from a Hamiltonian TN action. Uh, and also, as part of this definition, I'll say that M is compact, which maybe it depends who you ask. Um, right, so we have this, this uh, you know, this joint map is called the momentum map, this map from M into Rn. And it's, I guess, a classical result now from the 80s that uh, the image of F is a convex polytope. It's, it's the convex hull of the, um, of the fixed points of this, this Rn action. Uh, and in fact, we have, we have something better than this, which, which again, I assume most people here know, uh, which is if you're given a polytope that satisfies some conditions, it's called being a Delzon polytope, um, or you know, nowadays it is at least. Delzon proved that given uh, such a polytope, there's a unique toric integrable system associated to it. This is, you know, I mean, essentially, instead of toric integrable system, I might as well say toric variety. Um, so this is the, the very nice situation, which is that there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between toric systems and Delzon polytopes. So if you're interested in toric systems, you can really be studying polytopes, the rational polytopes, and the integer inwards pointing normal vectors to the faces, um, give you sort of a lot of more combinatorial things you can do. It's a very rigid situation, um, which, which is a very nice situation. And, uh, and the, the other thing is that if you actually look at Delzon's proof, um, he recovers the, the system by doing symplectic reduction on some power of, of, of C. Uh, so, you know, you can sort of go both ways in, in this bijection very easily. From the, from the toric system, you just look at the image of the momentum map, or from the polytope, you do some, some reduction that's, that's sort of controlled by the um, inwards pointing normal vectors. Okay, so what we'd like to do is get this to be less rigid. And um, so this is where the word semi-torque is going to enter into the talk. So a semi-torque integrable system is a four-dimensional integrable system. So we have two integrals. And um, th so these things Poisson commute. They're linearly independent. And then the extra stuff we require is that one of them generates an S1 action. So one of them comes from a periodic action um, and is, is proper, which all the examples I talk about today, M is going to be compact, so this won't be important. Um, and also there's requirements on the singularities of the joint map. And this comes sort of from, from classical integrable systems that um, in an integrable system, the singularities of, um, of the momentum map have a sort of Morse lemma that, that goes along with them. There's a classification of um, non-degenerate things, which is, uh, and the non-degenerate ones can be classified into different types. I mean, it's really exactly the analog of, of Morse theory. Um, and one of the types is the type we don't allow, which is, which is hyperbolic. So this is sort of the, the setup where things are, start being nice, I guess. Um, so we have non-degenerate, as in Morse theory. And, um, and, and also a little bit of terminology, I guess, we have here is that a uh, system is called simple if it has at most one focus focus point for each level set. So again, focus focus points are, are part of this classification. We'll have lots of pictures of, of pinch tori in, in a minute. Um, and, and so in order to get the classification to work that we want to work, we require that there aren't too many of these things in the same, in the same fiber of the Hamiltonian for the S1 action. So I mean, sort of part of the takeaway of this is that in a semi-toric system, um, you have regular points where the fiber is going to be a torus. You have rank one points, which have to be elliptic regular. So the fiber is going to be a circle. Um, and you have two different types of fixed points. One of them are the elliptic elliptic points, the sort of ones that show up in toric cases, where the fiber is just, is just a point. And the other ones are the focus focus points, where you have sort of a torus that degenerated. Um, so you have pictures like this. So the ones that can show up in the toric case are, um, you know, the, I mean, the tori of varying dimension, I guess, are the fibers that show up in, in, a, in a toric integrable system. And the sort of new one is this focus focus fiber, which if you don't require your system to be simple, it might have more than one pinch, which, I mean, in principle is OK. but. Um, We'll be restricting away from that sometimes. OK, and the idea now is that associated to every semi-torque system, uh, there's a thing that, that generalizes the Delzon polytope. Um, you get a polygon, so this is nice. But of course, I mean, there's other things drawn on this polygon, I guess. Um, 
which are these, these X's, which are these marked interior points, and also these, these dotted lines, which are supposed to be sort of cuts. And, and we'll talk in a minute about how to actually construct this. Uh, and these interior points, which are supposed to represent the focus focus points, um, are labeled with even a little bit more data that tells you about the dynamics around the focus focus point and sort of how all these things sit relative to each other, uh, which is a Taylor series and two variables and, um, and an integer. And, and I mean, I don't know, I'll spend 10 minutes going through all the invariants in detail. But this is sort of the picture to have in mind um, coming into the classification theorem. So uh, the five, I mean, so we have these five invariants, which is just the things I said. A polygon? Yes? Could you give an kind of example of a physical model? Like so, I mean, in fact, in, in a few slides, I'll have, I'll have one, but, but yes. Um, so, uh, I, I mean, something you can think of is um, the spherical pendulum is, is almost semi-toric, except that the um, Hamiltonian for the S1 action isn't proper. But a lot of this stuff will come through. Um, in, in the spherical pendulum. So that's a good idea to, to keep in mind. Um, so, okay, so, so this, is, this is the classification that sort of started things. Um, so in 2009 and 2011, Playa Vunagak had these two papers. And one of the papers says if these five invariants are the same for two semi torque systems, then those systems are isomorphic. And we get the other direction, sort of the Delzant direction, which says if you are given a list of invariants that satisfies some conditions, um, then. Uh, there is, is a unique um, semi toric system with those invariants. So you get this, this sort of bijection that we, that we wanted, the bijection from the toric case, uh, or similar to the toric case. So, um, right, so, so I, have, I have two things to do next. One is to explain each of these invariants in a little more detail with lots of pictures. And the other one is to, is to give an explicit example. Um, Well, the, the, I mean, it sort of is. I, uh, the semi toric polygon sort of tells you the vertical position of them. And then um, the height invariant is actually, I mean, it's the volume of a submanifold, but it sort of tells you their height in the, um, in the polygon. So, so essentially, the position is, is sort of encoded in there. Um, right, so, so I guess we should compare something, um, which is going to sort of lead to the question that I'm most interested in for this talk. In the toric case, it's, I mean, the semi toric case almost recovers the toric case exactly. We have a one to one correspondence between these invariants and semi toric systems, so we're, we're happy. But the toric case really tells you how to build these things. If I give you the polygon, it isn't just that there exists a unique semi or toric system with that polygon. You start with CD and you do some, some redu uh, symplectic reduction by a torus action. I mean, it, it's very explicit. You can really build the example. The semi toric systems, there is a class, or there is a construction in, in the paper. Um, but the construction is very local. You sort of build all these pieces of your manifold and of, and of your integrals, and you glue them all together. So you do construct things, and you see what things look like locally. Uh, but the point is that it's harder to really write down explicit examples in the semi toric case. Um, you know, it's hard to even detect, given some invariance, if it's on a familiar manifold and with like global analytic nice functions. I, I mean, it's really impossible, or almost impossible to see, I guess, initially. Um, so this is sort of to be uh, expected because semi toric systems are more complicated and the invariants are more complicated. And in fact, this is all in the smooth category because the construction is gluing. So there's, you know, the manifold might be a huge mess and the functions might be hard to write down. Uh, but, but sort of my goal is that there should be like some examples that are simple that we can write down. There, there was, essentially, there was one explicit example on a compact manifold sort of previous to this. Um, and so the way that, that it turned out to be natural to approach this is let's like fix some of the invariants. Let's fix the polygon invariant, the number of focus focus points, and then say, can we write down a simple example with those as its invariants? And then let the Taylor series and the twisting index, you know, the more complicated invariants, let them be whatever they need to be so that my example can be simple, so I can write something down. Um, right, so, so I'll, I'll go through the five invariants, at least to get some intuition about sort of how these things are constructed. So we'll, we'll start slow. One of them is the number of focus focus points invariant, which is just the number of focus focus points. So they're isolated, and in fact, there's finitely many, even if your manifold's not compact. Um, so this is an invariant. So this is the easy one, I guess. Um, so next I can talk about the polygon invariant. So uh, I mean, you have this, this map, right? F is the momentum map into R2. Its image is whatever. It isn't necessarily a polygon. 
Um, and, and so here I have the image sitting in, um, sitting in R2, I guess. And it has the image of the focus focus point is this little x. And um, you know, just looking at the fibers over this map, you get a, a Lagrangian torus vibration of, of m, of your manifold. Um, and, and I mean, I guess this idea goes back to Deustermont. Having a Lagrangian torus vibration gives you um, an affine structure on the base space. So, um, right, so, so we have a, an affine manifold, which is the base. And, uh, but it, it's, I mean, it's not useful to you, I guess, as it is. The, the sort of the secret, the reason things are so nice in the toric case is that the affine structure of the base space is equal to the affine structure of Rn that it's sitting in. So you can actually look at it and look at the angles and see all of the data that's sitting there. Um, you're like looking at the affine structure. Um, and, and in the, the semitor case, there is an affine structure on the base, but you can't really look at it so easily. So it's, it's harder to sort of extract data about. Um, but, but this was something that Sanbu Nagak solved in 2007 that was um, based around the work of, of Symington from 2002, sort of expanding it into a more specific case, I guess, um, which is that what you'd really like to do is straighten out this affine structure so it agrees with the affine structure of R2. But you can't do that because the affine structure really only sits on the regular points. And a focus focus point is a, sort of a puncture in the middle of your regular points. So you have some monodromy in the affine structure. And that's why you can't straighten it out. And so really, the solution is to do the most naive thing you can do, which is say, well, I don't like the monodromy, so let's make the space simply connected. And the way you do it is you just make a cut. You, you, you know, get out your scissors, and you make a cut to cut out this puncture of, um, of the image of the momentum map. And now, with what's left, you can embed it in an affine way into R2 and straighten it out, and you get a polygon. So this is the sort of semi toric polygon. You get pictures like this. Um, and, and now, I mean, a thing to notice that's, that's sort of a subtle bit also sort of important is that uh, it makes sense to cut vertically because you have sort of this Hamiltonian S1 action gives you a preferred direction. Um, but instead of cutting up, you could cut down. And then what you get is, is a different polygon. Um, so what you really get in the, in the semi toric as the, the semi-toric polygon invariant is a family of polygons. And in fact, it's an infinite family of polygons, because when you straighten it out, there's like an extra integer degree of freedom that has to do with sort of skewing it that I will mostly not talk about, because it's a little bit less interesting. But the, the sort of important degree of freedom is that you can either cut up or cut down, and you get different polygons. And all these, the sort of package all these polygons together is the, is the polygon invariant. So the admissible data is almost what you would, I mean, you can sort of piece it together. The point is that the corners of the polygons that are not close to a cut, have to, they have to be the sort of corners that can show up in, a, in the toric case. Because away from the cuts, after you straighten things out, everything is toric. And then at the cuts, um, the monodromy matrix of the focus focus point is, is known. And it just has to be that this bend introduced at that point is due to that monodromy matrix. It's something like 1, 1, 1, 0. Um, so I mean exactly like this, something that goes from uh, slope 1 half to slope minus 1 half or something like that on the top. Um, and, and this is sort of what it means to be an admissible polygon, is that it, it looks toric away from the cuts, and at the cuts it behaves exactly the way that the monodromy matrix of the focus focus point tells you it has to. Oh, and then they, you're right, so and then they have to all sort of um, correspond to each other. So for instance, I mean, the left side of these two polygons are the same. So the right side should differ exactly by the monodromy of the focus focus point. Um, and that's what, I mean, really, you can think about the family as, as a group action. Um, start, as soon as you have one polygon, you get them all. It's, it's an action. Um, but they're all going to be important. Um, OK, so that's the polygon of here. And this, in, in some sense, this is sort of the most key one, especially for, for me, at least. Um, and then and here's the, the height invariant tells you about the height of the focus focus point in the polygon once you straighten things out. Um, and, and really, you can think about this as like drawing a line here and taking the volume of its pre-image. It's, it's the, the symplectic volume of some submanifold. Um, and, and then this is, well, what I was just saying is that now that we have a picture of a semi toric polygon on here, we can see that the corners away from the cut are Delzant corners. And on the cut are something sort of predictable due to the monodromy. Um, so, so this straightened out momentum map is a torque momentum map on the open torque manifold M minus the preimage of the cuts. Maybe that's the best way to think about it. Um, 
Right, so, so now there's, there's two invariants left to talk about, which I'll talk about sort of briefly, that are, uh, I don't know, I mean also, um, they have to do with classifying the focus-focus points, I guess. So the Taylor series, this was something that was, that was done in 2003, again by Sambu Nagak. Um, the idea is you want to classify a focus-focus fiber. So you want to think about a neighborhood, not just of the focus-focus point, because I told you this is like Morse theory, so all focus-focus points should be the same locally. But if you think about the fiber that they're in, this pinched torus, um, I want to uh, sort of classify the dynamics that can happen on that fiber is really what it comes down to. And the strategy is to start with a nearby fiber. So this is supposed to be a torus that's about to pinch. And then um, pick a point on the torus. Use the, the J that's given and the H that comes from the, the um, local normal form for a focus focus point. So, so there's a preferred H. Uh, and now pick a point, follow the flow of H, and then follow the flow of J. So you follow the flow of H till you get back to the same J orbit, and then you follow the flow of J to get back to exactly the point you started on. And this gives you uh, two numbers. And you can think about how these numbers vary as you get close to the focus focus point. So what really happens is they're going to blow up sort of logarithmically. But if you subtract that logarithmic blow up, then you're left with the germ of a function. And that gives you the classification. So how, how is it, does it differ from being a logarithmic blow up? Um, and instead of germ of a function, we take a Taylor series and two variables. Um, and the thing to, to note about this is that when Sam was originally doing this in 2003, he was really not looking at semi-torque systems. Of course, this word didn't exist yet. Um, he was just looking at a neighborhood of a torus or of a focus-focus fiber. Um, so you can't detect a Dane twist because it's sort of just, it isn't embedded anywhere. It's just sort of by itself. I, I mean, it doesn't make any sense to say, when I was taking this first flow, how many times did it wrap? Right? That, I mean, if I just draw a cycle on a torus and say, how many times does this, does this loop in the other direction? That's not a well-defined question. Um, and that sort of perfectly sets us up for the last invariant, which is the twisting index. And a way to think about that is as soon as you choose a polygon, you make the cuts, you choose a polygon, that gives you, away from the cuts, a torque momentum map, which the flows of those, those torque, um, you know, the, the, the momentum map components or the, the torque momentum map that let you define the polygon give you something to compare this cycle against. So I'll call this cycle gamma. And um, you can compare that cycle against sort of this background toric cycle, this, this now this purple picture here. Um, and now you can say, oh, given this polygon, how does the dynamics around the focus focus point twist around the torus? And this gives you sort of, uh, this gives you an integer. And so this integer is the twisting index. So the twisting index is, is sort of a, a really subtle invariant. It's already kind of hard to define. And also it's, I mean, I say it's an integer, but really it's an integer once you choose a polygon. So there's all of these different polygons you can choose. And depending on the polygons, um, you get different integers. It's like an assignment to each polygon. There's an integer. Um, I mean, you just have to give it for one polygon, actually. And the group action sort of tells you who, what it should be for everyone else. But, um, but it's a little bit hard to see. And, and so the, the way that I've just described this in terms of cycles is not actually the original definition. The original definition is in terms of some sort of preferred local momentum maps. Um, which, which is also very useful, but I think this is more useful. In fact, we're trying to compute it in some cases, but this is something, I don't know, for the future, I guess. Um, OK, so th those are the five invariants. Um, and now what I can do is I can give a, a really explicit example. Um, and the example is the coupled angular momenta. So this is, the, this is due to Savinsky and Zielinski in 1999. And the idea is you take um, you know, two spheres. I, I'm writing them as unit spheres, but, but this R1 and R2 are really supposed to be the radius of the sphere. So you have two spheres of different radii. And um, let's give them coordinates as with the usual embedding into R3. And, uh, and now these are the two integrals we're going to take. So J, the first integral, is supposed to be the, the periodic one. This is the, just the sum of the heights. So the action of this is rotating both spheres at the same time. Um, and H is sort of a convex combination of two different things. So it really, the coupled angular momentum system is really a family of systems, depending on this parameter t. If t equals 0, then h is just z1. And so you have as one of your integrals rotate both spheres, as your other integral rotate just one sphere. And that's a toric system. And uh, as t, you know, when t is equal to 1, that term is gone, and you just have this dot product between your two vectors. 
So that really means that you know, the, the sort of invariant here is the, the angle between the two vectors as you, as you rotate them. Um, right, and the point that I'm about to care about is north pole, south pole, so I'll call it ns. So it's just the top of one cross the bottom of the other one. And sort of the, um, the result here that we, that we care about is, is sketched in, in uh, well, sort of stated in, in Sadevsky Zelensky's original paper in 1999 and proven uh, along with many other things. They, they computed all the invariants, actually, in a, in a paper of Leflac Plyo in, in 2018. Um, and the idea is that there's two different times so that for t less than t minus, you start with, I mean, for instance, you start at t equals 0 with a torque system. There's no focus focus points. But then if you increase t a little bit, it stays like that. There's no focus focus points. And then for an instant, at north pole, south pole, you have a degeneracy. And then as you continue on with t, you have a focus focus point. So, and that focus focus point is at north pole, south pole. So you have a, this, this pinched torus fiber that shows up. Uh, and then you continue, it becomes degenerate, and then that point becomes elliptic, elliptic again. So there's like a transition going on on that point. So this is, I have sort of a fake animation, um, which is, this is the image of the momentum map when t equals 0. It's the toric system. Uh, you increase t a bit, and it deforms a little bit, but it still has zero focus focus points. You increase t some more, and one of these points sort of jumps off of the edge. So this used to be an elliptic elliptic point, um, but now it's in the interior. Its fiber is, is a pinch torus. And then it sort of runs across the momentum map until it crashes into the bottom. So, the, um, so we have this one parameter family of, of systems. And th this is, I think, a, a good example to think about for semi toric systems. Um, so I think I have a picture now of it. Right. So th this is a picture of it all together. So you have this transition from t equals 0 to t equals 1, starting with the toric system and ending with something which is not a polygon, but kind of looks like a polygon. Um, so OK, so there's one thing. And yes? Uh, is this sort of representative that you can always deform a semi toric system so that the focus focus points becomes vertis vertices of the toric system? So this is, I mean, this is, uh, um, in a lot of cases, you can do something like that. Th this is sort of my my goal is to see when we can do this. Um, it's a little bit different. I, I mean, we'll talk a little bit later, I guess, that this corner is, is a very special corner. L let me draw one more picture uh, first, which is that we have this deformation between the two systems. The semi torque system lives in the middle. Um, on the other hand, you could take, for instance, t equals 1 half. That's a semi torque system. And I can have some affine structure and straighten that affine structure out. I can do the stuff that I was doing 10 slides ago um, and make the semi torque polygons. And it turns out that the semi torque polygons look like this. So now this should be a very sort of leading slide that um, one of the semi torque polygons looks exactly like the momentum map image for t equals 0. And the other semi torque polygon looks kind of like the momentum map image for t equals 1. So to find a semi torque system with some semi torque polygons that we like, you might want to try and transition between two different systems that are somehow associated to those polygons. And, and so this is sort of what motivated the project, is I, I have systems with certain polygons that I want to write down. And it would be nice if I could somehow use those polygons to predict a transition like this that would, would make it so that when I set t equals 1 half, I have that system that I want. Um, it turns out, I don't know, it turns out it was, it was harder than I thought it would be. But this is the idea. Um, and, and so with this in mind, we make a definition, which is essentially we're going to just try and generalize the um, uh, coupled angular momentum. So a fixed S1 family is just a family of, of, two di or of four dimensional integrable systems where the momentum map has just a fixed S1 action and the other integral is allowed to change um, smoothly with some parameter t. So it's really just like the coupled angular momenta. And a semi toric family is one of these systems which is semi toric for all but finitely many values of t, where potentially some sort of transitions happen. So you have a, a family of semi toric systems that are, are changing as t changes and undergoing some, some sort of transitions at, de, at what are called degenerate times. Um, and, and the reason I call them degenerate times is because of the first thing I'm going to write down here, uh, which is that a semi toric family never has any hyperbolic points. This, I, I don't know, if you're thinking about things kind of like Morse theory, this makes sense that if you have a Morse function with a hyperbolic point and you perturb it a little bit, um, it will still have a hyperbolic point. It's kind of an open condition, I guess, is the point. 
Um, and so if it's semi-toric for all but finitely many values of t, yeah? Sorry, oh, uh, well, if it's semi-toric for all but finitely many values of t, then it can never have hyperbolic points at, um, at those isolated times when it's not semi-toric. And, and so what this means is that the only way for it to be not semi-toric is to have a degenerate fiber. So a fiber that, that you know, in this classification of singular fibers is, is degenerate. It doesn't, doesn't fit into the classification, I guess. So did you have? Yeah, so you don't, do you require anything at the degenerate time? So at the moment, no. And in fact, this is, so I mean, some pages of the paper are, um, well, are devoted to a large list of everything that can happen at degenerate times with as many examples as we could come up with, which was kind of, uh, I don't know. I, I, I think it was, it was fun to write, but it's lots of pages. So. But it's everything. I mean, these are all the things that can happen. <laughs> it's written down. Um, so yeah, lots of strange things can happen, but maybe not so many strange things. That, I mean, it was, it was doable to write them all down, so it's not so wild, I guess. Um, so uh, so there, there's other things we can learn. We can learn, for instance, that um, this is already known for a semi toric system, that the fixed set of the S1 action, the S1 action that comes from the J, is a disjoint union of points and fixed spheres. And the only way you can have fixed spheres is if they occur at the max or the min of J. So I'll, I'll draw a picture in a minute that maybe will make this more clear. Um, and uh, uh, oh, and, and another thing you can notice about semi toric families is that if you have something that's not on one of these fixed spheres, and it's a rank zero point, or it's a fixed point of the, the integral system as a whole, um, then it's always a fixed point. Um, but in the fixed sphere, things can sort of move. So that there's a little bit of specialness going on in the fixed sphere. Um, and, and again, I'll have some, um, I don't know, I, will have some, I have some exa explicit examples by the end of the talk. Um, and, and the other thing you can notice, which again is sort of well known, is uh, if you start with a point of focus focus type, and then after some time it becomes elliptic elliptic type, so it, its fiber changes from a torus to a point, the only way it can do that is passing through a degeneracy. Um, this is usually called the Hamiltonian Hoff bifurcation. Um, this is also related to something called a nodal trade in, in Symington's original paper. This is where the, the sort of internal focus focus point internal to the momentum map crashes under the boundary and then becomes elliptic elliptic. Um, so all of these things together give us sort of a picture of what these families look like. You have some momentum map image, it has some internal marked points and um, corners on the outside. And as t runs, these things kind of move up and down, because they can't move left and right. They, their images move up and down, but they correspond to their same points. And maybe they crash into the boundary. When they crash into the boundary, you pass through a degeneracy. Uh, and, and there's also sort of other degeneracies that can happen that are, that are maybe less interesting for us. But it, it turns out, I mean, it's a, uh, it doesn't feel like a very restrictive definition, because I'm letting anything happen at those degenerate times. But there's really not that many things that can happen. Um, uh, but, but what I'll do now is, is put up what is now very much a restrictive definition. Um, uh, a semi-toric transition family with transition point P is essentially a semi-toric family where the only interesting things happen at P. We have degenerate times T minus and T plus. Before T minus, P is elliptic elliptic. In between T minus and T plus, P is focus focus. And after T plus, P is elliptic elliptic again, and no other degenerate points happen at, at anywhere else at any time. So this is really exactly like the coupled angular momenta. And things we can notice is that, well, from the previous slide, we know that um, this point has to be degenerate at t equals, um, at, at these degenerate times, because it's transitioning between types. And we know the other rank zero points can't change type. So if you have five focus focus points for t less than t minus, you're going to have six for in between, and then you'll have back to five. Nothing else is happening except for this point p. Um, and the example to keep in mind is exactly the coupled angular momenta. So this is sort of the setup to generalize the coupled angular momenta and hopefully use other polygons and get other examples of semi-toric systems on compact manifolds that were not known. Um, so uh, right, and sort of to get a picture of what's going on and, and to try and come up with these, these examples we want to come up with and, and understand what's happening, a really good thing to do is to reduce by the S1 action. So we have this, this Hamiltonian S1 action. We can do the symplectic reduction, which I'm reminding you here is uh, you fix a level of your Hamiltonian J, and then you mod that level out by the S1 action. And, uh, and now I can, I can sort of say that if you're at a regular value of J, um, 
having a non-degenerate point in the integrable system sense is exactly the same as h descended to the reduced space being a Morse function. This is why this is sort of a natural definition. I mean, the actual definition of non-degeneracy for um, uh, singular points of integrable systems has, has to do with the, the Hessians of, the, of H and J spanning a Carton subalgebra of quadratic forms. I mean, it's kind of a dense definition, but this is essentially the idea of it, is that it should be like Morse. Um, so now we can ask, in a semi-toric system or a semi-toric family, um, what does a reduced space look like? So first, if you're at the, the boundary, so you're thinking the far left or far right side of the polygon, uh, the only thing that can happen is that the reduced space is either a sphere or a point. And, and this is exactly the fixed sphere or the, the fixed point. Because if you have a fixed sphere and you do reduction at that, at that level, you still, I mean, there's nothing to reduce, right? There's no S1 action. Um, but OK, that's, that's one of the cases. The other case is what if you take any value of j which isn't the boundary? And the point is that the, simple, or the reduced space is always homeomorphic to a sphere, but only sometimes diffeomorphic to a sphere. If you're at a regular value of uh, the S1 action, then you, get, you, know, you actually get a sphere. You, you get diffeomorphic to a sphere. But if you're at um, a point for which dj equals 0, so a fiber, for instance, that includes a focus-focus point or an elliptic-elliptic point, then, um, well, then something more complicated will happen, which I have some pictures of. Um, but, but first, this is sort of the not singular case. So if I reduce at this level, this orange level, I get a sphere, a sphere which is the fixed sphere. If I reduce at this blue level, I get a sphere. Um, the green level has sort of a smaller sphere. And if I reduce, for instance, at, um, at this very corner point here, I just get, I just get a point. Um, OK, but what happens at, uh, at the not regular points, which are sort of the interesting ones, which is that uh, you get a teardrop or a pinch sphere. So you get one of these spheres, but there's little pinches that correspond to the fixed points of, of j. So you get a picture like this. Um, so now, I mean, I can draw some pictures for the reduced space of the coupled angle momentum, for instance. I mean, it's, it's, this picture is vague enough that it might as well be any semi-toric transition family, I guess. Um, and the idea, I guess, is that uh, you know, the reduced space at the level that has a focus focus point for some times has a pinch in it. And something you might, I mean, for instance, if you take t equals 0 in the coupled angular momenta, then you don't have any weirdness going on. There's no focus focus point. And, and in that fiber, there's, there's only two singular points, the top and the bottom of the polygon. And sort of the, the way that I think about this is that you took the pinch point, the, the point that could potentially be causing problems and making weird things happen, and you sort of hid it under a critical point of h that had to be there anyway, which is to say that that the reduced h is a Morse function on this sphere. Um, or, well, this is, this is a pinch sphere, so it's not really a Morse function. But it's a function on this sphere, and it's going to have a max and a min anyway. So if we take the pinch point and we hide it right under the max of h, so we think about h as the height function here, then it doesn't really disrupt things, I guess. But as soon as we, we make t a little bit larger, then um, and we can think about this as changing which direction h is in. Now, this pinch point is in the same fiber as other things. And so if I want to say, well, wait a minute, this is what the level set of h looks like in the reduced space. How can I find the corresponding fiber? Well, all I have to do is, is take the s1 orbit of, of this thing, of this fiber in the reduced space. Well, every point that isn't the pinch point has an s1 orbit. I mean, it has some non-trivial s1 orbit. There's some loop attached to it, essentially. Um, but the pinch point is fixed. It's a fixed point of j. That was the whole point. It's a fixed point of the S1 action. So it doesn't get a whole circle. It, it gets nothing. It's, you know, it just stays as itself. And so you get a pinch torus as the, as the fiber of the integrable system upstairs. And then you sort of continue increasing time in, in your coupled angular momenta, for instance, and the torus gets bigger. And then you increase time some more, and the torus starts to get smaller again until suddenly you've hidden your, your badness back inside of this point. Now it's the minimum of h instead of the maximum of h. So th this is exactly that transition. We have a dot on the, on the top that then goes down and becomes a dot on the bottom. And in between, it's generating these, these pinched tori. Um, OK, so this is sort of the, the general stuff that's going on, I guess. Uh, yeah? So you said that this is an orbital? Yeah, it, it's at the, um, you know, the, the fixed points of the S1 action are going to give you orbifold points in the um, uh, oh, reduced space. Not quite an orbifold since the point doesn't have finite vector field. The point, 
Oh, right. I guess it's not. I, I guess I shouldn't say it's an orbifold. It, it's some sort of singular something. I, I said orbifold. Maybe I should be careful about what I say. Um, but, um, but, but OK, so I guess we have, we have maybe two more general things to say about these families, and then I can start using our knowledge to, to make examples. Um, so one thing is that if you have a semi toric family, so it has these degenerate times, but in between these degenerate times, the number of focus focus points don't change. We knew that already, because when things change type, they um, cause a degeneracy. But also, the, the polygon invariant doesn't change at all. The polygon invariant stays exactly the same between degenerate times. It's only at degenerate times that the polygon invariant can change somehow. Um, and then you can ask, well, how does it change? And uh, we have, I guess, I guess, one answer to this, which is that if you're in a, a nice situation, if um, you're in a semi toric transition family, so you have just one point where interesting stuff is happening, and the weights of the J action at that point are, are magnitude 1, um, then roughly we started with some semi toric polygons for T less than T minus. And then when we got between T minus and T plus, we sort of have an extra, uh, we have an extra focus focus point where we can cut up or down. So it sort of doubles the amount of semi toric polygons. And then you go back down, and after T plus, now you have the amount of semi toric polygons again, because you lose this freedom of cutting up or down. And the idea is that if it happens that the weights of the J action are plus or minus 1, then the polygons in the middle, of which there's twice as many for T less than T minus or T more than T minus, is just take the ones for T less than T minus and take the ones for T more than T minus and union them. And this is the set of polygons of the sort of intermediate system. And, and I say roughly because you have to draw the lines on it and, and things like this. I mean, there's a little bit, they have a little bit more decorations attached to them, I guess. Um, but the general picture is something like this. You start with a polygon that looks like this. Then for a while, you have a semi torque system with one focus focus point, so it has two polygons. Um, and then after the next degeneracy, you have only one polygon again. But these two polygons represent the two polygons you started with. It's exactly what we were sort of thinking about when I drew the coupled angular momenta on the board the first time, which is that somehow the two limiting polygons tell us about the multiple polygons that happen in between. Um, and, and so this means the, uh, I guess, this means the, the strategy we want to work is, is a reasonable thing that might work. Um, so the idea would be, and in fact, this, these polygons are the first example I'm going to look at. Uh, I want a system with these polygons in the middle as their semi toric invariant. What I do is I write down a system with this first polygon as its, as its polygon, and I write down a system with this other polygon as its polygon, and I try to figure out a way I can transition between them to find the semi torque system uh, in between. And so, well, if you're looking at these polygons and I say I want something that starts with t equals 0 with this polygon, then um, you should think about the Herzberg surface, which is exactly what we thought about. Um, so I can write down the Herzberg surface as C4 mod some, uh, or, you know, um, symplectic quotient by some, uh, some torus action using Delzon's classification, I guess. I mean, there's lots of ways to write down the first Herzberg surface. Um, but this is nice because it gives us these coordinates. The coordinates you want to, to U4 that come from C4 let us write things down. Um, and the usual toric system is, uh, well, J and H that look like this. So I'm calling instead of H, I'm calling it H0 because this will be where we start for our transition family. And that gives this polygon up here as its image. It's a toric system, so in this case, it's really its image. And the idea is that, well, we want to transition between that polygon and this other polygon that essentially looks like that polygon, but upside down. So a totally reasonable thing to sort of be the first thing you try is let's transition between H0 and minus H0. Of course, if you just do like a convex combination of H0 and minus H0, you're going to sort of be in trouble. Um, nothing really interesting happens. Where you want the transitions to happen, this whole thing is going to collapse to a line. Uh, essentially, T minus equals T plus. So all the degeneracies happen at once. Um, but we can fix this by sort of putting in a term that, that fattens things up a little bit at that point. So here I have a convex combination of H0 and minus H0 plus gamma is just a parameter. Um, you know, this term, which is, I mean, a little bit hard to, to motivate, I guess, but in some sense it's the only term you could choose. Because it needs to um, not be too high of order because it needs to show up in the Hessian. And also it needs to be invariant under the torus action that I had on the, I mean, which is the definition of the Herzberg surface. If it's not invariant under the torus action, it doesn't really descend properly. Um, and it needs to be real because, I mean, the output should be real. Uh, so it's a little bit hard to see what function needs to be chosen. In fact, this is a, you know, a lot of the difficulty. Um, but, but we proved that, that this works. So uh, this is a semi-toric transition family, meaning it starts with no focus focus points, 
So here's a bunch of pictures. It starts with no focus focus points. It's the toric system. Time runs along. And then eventually, one of these points sort of jumps across the middle to try and crash into the bottom. And at, for instance, t equals 0.5, we have a new semi-toric system, which, which hadn't been found before, I guess. Um, and, then, and then you continue, and then it crashes into the bottom. And, and you have something that, you know, at the end, you don't actually end up with a toric system. But this is just like the coupled angular momenta as well. At the end, you have like a little bit bumped out polygon, something that isn't quite um, a toric system, but it's a semi-toric system without any focus focus points. So you can associate a polygon to it. Um, OK, and, and the thing to notice about this system, I guess, is that uh, you know, the, the vertical wall here, the vertical wall on the left side of it corresponds to a fixed sphere of the j-action. This is, I mean, I, I often use the terminology vertical wall and fixed sphere sort of in interchangeably. Um, because if you have a vertical wall here, the, the fiber above this is a sphere that, that the S1 action doesn't, doesn't move. Um, it's a fixed surface of the, j, uh, of the um, S1 action. And the fixed points, so the, the top and bottom of that sphere, essentially, the rank 0 points of the integrable system, um, since they're on the fixed sphere, can move around the fixed sphere. Um, and, and that's like something that we, we had to do to get this to work, because uh, really what happens is this point sort of likes being next to this point that it starts out next to. And if you're not careful and you try and have this, this other upper left point stay on top, you end up with, I mean, the boundary kind of pulls in instead. I actually, I'll have a picture kind of well similar to that a little bit later. Um, uh, but since it's on a fixed sphere, this is like a very special case. And I guess that's what I'm trying to communicate is that, that the first Hirzeberg surface is a nice case because the S1 action has a fixed sphere. Um, and in fact, we came up with another semi-toric family on, uh, on the first Hirzeberg surface by just putting in a factor of j here that really undoes what I just said. They no longer have the fixed points moving on the sphere. The same points stay fixed. But they still switch sides. And in just in this case, they pass through each other. Um, so you have this purple point on top and this green point on the bottom. As you run along, eventually they collide. And then your whole sphere turns upside down. So you, you see that, that at every case, that the, the red point is sort of adjacent to the purple point. It like comes with it. And again, this is sort of exploiting the fixed sphere. So the, sort of the point, I guess, is that systems with fixed spheres were a little bit easier to deal with. Um, so and and yes, yeah, so at this point the whole sphere collapses. And this is one of the when we were enumerating all of the possible degeneracies. This is one of the ones. So you have a fiber that that collapses, and the whole thing becomes at the same height. Um, okay, and, and I'll have one more example, which is not a semi-toric family, but it has some nice pictures and it's sort of indicative of what I'm getting interested in for the future, um, which is a system like this. So you start with an elliptic elliptic point. As t increases. It becomes, it actually is focus focus for a little while. It leaves the boundary. Um, and then at some point, one parameter families of, of rank one points start coming out of it. And these are the hyperbolic points, so the points that are disallowed in semi toric systems. Um, but really, what you have here is you have this sort of hyperbolic triangle, which is a, a kind of typical picture. Inside of the triangle, the fibers aren't connected. Um, and the boundary of the triangle, one of the boundaries is where the fibers become connected. You sort of have two tori crashing into each other. And the, uh, the other fiber is like, uh, is elliptic, elliptic, or sorry, elliptic regular points. It, it's sort of like you have a boundary. It, the red point becomes um, elliptic, elliptic there. It's almost like it's, it's in its, the nearby components, it's, it's in like the corner of a momentum map. I, and then it sort of jumps off of the edge and, and some interesting things happen. So this is. I don't know. This is what I want to work on now, is, is thinking about hyperbolic points. It, it's, much, it's, it's a little bit more relevant for more physical systems if you have hyperbolic points. It, it's a strong restriction to not have them. Um, but OK, so we'll leave that, we'll leave that there, I guess. Um, oh, and th this is similar to something that, that Holger uh, Doolin and Alvaro Playo did in, in 2016, where they took a focus focus point and changed it into a hyperbolic, sort of replaced it with a hyperbolic triangle. Uh, but everything they did was local. And this is sort of global. So it, it's a little bit different of an example, I guess. Um, OK, so I have, I don't know, 13 minutes. And in these minutes, um, I'm going to essentially do two things. One is I'm going to motivate some, some examples that I want to find. So, so far, I was just finding examples because, I don't know, because a year ago, there was only one compact example. Um, uh, but, but now, I want to say understand examples that are motivated by um, sort of semi-toric minimal models project and, uh, or program. And I'm going to you know, come up with some partial information about their invariants and say, I want to find these systems, and then try and use these strategies we've been developing to find those systems. And then those, so those are the two things I'll do, and then it'll be 
4.30 and I'll be done. Um, right, and, and so the idea is that, you know, this map, this straightened out momentum map, F, you know, sort of straightened out to fit the affine structure, away from the cuts, this is a toric map. Um, you know, it looks like a toric integrable system. So if you can do a blow up on a toric variety, then you can do a blow up of this, an equi you know, T2 equivariant blow up, I guess. Um, and so the goal is, well, if I can do a blow up near the elliptic elliptic points of a, of a semi toric system, then let's try and find the systems that don't admit blowdowns. Um, this is usual minimal model stuff. And, and of course, the reason we care about this is then every system can be made from these by doing a bunch of blow ups. So, so the things we want to understand is the minimal models and the operation of doing blow ups. Um, and as in the toric case, as long as you're away from the cut, the um, blow ups correspond to a, a corner chop. And, and in fact, I mean, maybe I should have included a better picture here. Um, lots of sort of strange things can happen in, in the semi toric case. For instance, you can make this blow up bigger big enough that it actually touches the cut, because the cut doesn't really represent anything real. I mean, this corner that you see at the top of the cut like, isn't really there. There's not an elliptic elliptic point there. Um, it's just sort of an artifact of the polygon you happen to choose. I mean, in fact, you might as well have just chosen the cut down. Um, so, uh, so the sort of combinatorics of what the polygons look like as you do blow-ups of different sizes is a little bit more complicated. Um, and, and in fact, here's, a, here's sort of an example. If you have a, a polygon like this, it doesn't look like you can do a blowdown. Because clearly, you can't really like fill this in, because there isn't even really a corner here. Um, but then you realize, if you chose one of the other polygons, cut the other direction, now this does admit a blowdown, actually. I mean, it's, you, know, you can check that that corner is smooth. Um, so it's sort of hard to see what's going on. And then sort of the initial thing that you would want to try to do, maybe, is emulating the Torah case, think about um, you know, you have a, a Delson polytope. We can think about the fan, which is the integral inwards pointing normal vectors, and, and do some, I don't know, do some math with those. Uh, but essentially, if you take the integral inwards pointing normal vectors of this, it's, it's going to be sort of a mess, because there's, I mean, really, the integer, the inward pointing normal vector of this edge and of this edge sort of should be the same, because this, this corner isn't really there. Um, and, and so this was uh, a problem I solved with Daniel Kane and Oliver Playa uh, a few years ago. And we define something called the semi toric helix. And the idea is that every time you have a corner that shouldn't really be there, just straighten it out. And uh, you end up with, instead of all of the inwards pointing normal vectors, you straighten out the corner that, that doesn't really mean anything. You throw away the interior of the polygon, because you don't really care about that anyway. Um, and then you continue. And, and actually, if you, if you kept continuing like this, you, know, you would keep making corners and corners and corners and corners. Like you don't. Instead of following the boundary of a polygon and getting back where you started, you follow the boundary of a polygon that doesn't close, and then you can keep going, which is why we call it a helix. So you actually get sort of an infinite circle of, um, uh, of, of these integer vectors. And uh, I, I mean, I don't know. There's lots of subtleties here. It takes a lot of effort to explain it all. But the idea is that by transitioning between sort of these vectors with, with matrices in SL2Z, um, you can uh, try to classify these. In fact, you sort of need a, a universal cover of SL2Z. So there's some, some algebraic stuff that happens here. Um, uh, but, but then you get a result. And the result is that, uh, I mean, the point is that. Would you mind to go back just one second? Yeah. What does it mean, this uh, arrow going from left to right? So, how, how so I mean, what I mean is that, uh, maybe I can draw on the board. Um, you know, I started with. Uh, a polygon that looks like this. But what I really want to do is start here, go up, go over. But this corner isn't really there, so let's just pretend it's not there. And now this one has a certain angle associated to it. And then um, now I'm not back where I started, but let's just sort of keep going. And you get, you know, you sort of go like this. And you, I mean, it turns into sort of a mess. But the idea is that if you take all of these inwards pointing normal vectors, then you have um, you know, uh, a bunch of, uh, well, I mean, you have um, a bunch of vectors like this, so that sort of the, any subsequent two of them span Z2, which is what you want, which would not be true if you allowed these sort of messed up corners. And after you, uh, you know, after you repeat four of them, you're not back to where you started, 
but you're back to where you started up to uh, the monodromy matrix of the focus focus point. And so this is sort of taking this polygon and saying, okay, I'm going to unwind it, and then I'm going to just write some of the vectors, because really it goes on infinitely. But actually, if I give you three, that tells you everything, because we also know the monodromy. The monodromy is, is this to the, the number of focus focus points, or maybe, maybe the transpose of that. I don't know. <laughs> um, does that make sense? Um, so you recover this thing that you can, that you can use SL2C. Um, and, and then you have to sort of, I don't know, work in SL2Z, but you also want to know something about the, um, how many, you know, sort of looping around the origin. There's, there's some, I don't know, there's, there's lots of details to deal with. Um, but, but in fact, you can, you can classify them, I guess, is the point. And, um, uh, and you come up with seven different families, which are the ones that do not admit uh, blowdowns. Because once, I mean, once you unwind it, then checking if something emits a blowdown is very easy. Um, or relatively easy, I guess. Um, and so you have these seven families. I've drawn six of them. The seventh one is, is much more complicated. It has more vectors, uh, but also is, is more or less explicit. Um, and so the idea in my, well, now in five minutes, I guess, the idea is, um, is to try and find examples of these families. And in fact, I'm, I'm going to, in the interest of, of time, I'm going to skip uh, some important detail, which is that we can notice that system, well, 4, 5, and 6 have this rightwards pointing vector as, as in their helix, which means their polygon has a vertical wall in it, which means their S1 action has a fixed surface, has a fixed sphere. Um, and actually, it turns out that there's, there's sort of another surgery you can do um, called a semi-toric blowdown by, well, by some people, I guess, that um, is sort of implicit in, in Symington's work and uh, is made more explicit in uh, a paper by Holock, uh, Sabatini, Seppi, and, and Symington um, that isn't out yet. So I, I, won't give, I won't give a bunch of details about it because it's kind of from the future. But the, but the point, I guess, is that, um, is that four through seven are, aren't really that minimal. One two, one, two, and three are the ones we're most interested in, I, I guess. This is, this is the motivation. Um, and so I can, from the polygons, try and write down the, po or from the helices, try and write down the polygons. Um, and they look like this. And type 1, actually, uh, Cons uh, Constantinos F. Sathieu, uh told me that he knew about a system with, uh, with this as its semi-toric uh, polygon after I, after I gave a talk some, I don't know, six months ago. Um, so, so he solved that part for us. Um, and, and that's on CP2, which, which is, again, sort of something you would expect, because the t equals 0 system looks like a triangle, which might make you think it has something to do with CP2. Um, and so what we have to find is these last two examples. And, and, and I can sort of sketch what these last two examples, what they look like. And, and this, is, this is my goal for the rest of the talk. Find a, an explicit system of type 3 and an explicit system of type 2. And it would be great if these things were semi-torque families, because that's what I happen to be interested in at the moment. Um, so for a minimal system of type 3, we want a polygon that looks like this. And we actually already have one example of something of type 3, which the couple angular momenta, the second to last time I'll have you think about it, I guess, um, is minimal of type 3 with k equals minus 1, because it's, it's t equals 0 system was this, this parallelogram. Um, and, uh, and, and something we notice, and which is of course important for the minimal models program as well, is that if you start with a semi torque family, and you do a blow up on each member of the family or a blow down on each member of the family, then you still get a semi torque family, which, which in fact, this lemma is much harder to prove than it sounds like it is. Because in principle, the manifold you end up with has to do with the vibration you use in the blow up. So you have to sort of identify things. But, um, but it works. Um, and I mean, the idea here is we should look at the nth here's a Berg surface, which has a polygon that looks like this. Um, but we don't really like this. In fact, because the S1 action associated to this None of the um, points have uh, plus or minus one as their as their weights, and um, you know if I tried to draw a dotted line under this, it wouldn't be Delzant because this corner w or it wouldn't be a semi toric polygon because this corner would be n not the right type of corner. But we can do a little bit of trickery, which is just add H once into J, and now it looks like this. And now this corner is exactly the kind of corner we like. It's a corner that looks just like the corner in the the couple angle momenta where I can draw a dotted line under it or not. It's sort of a special kind of corner, the only thing that can exist with a, with a cut under it or not. Um, and it has these, these J weights that we like, plus or minus 1. Uh, 
So this is the polygon for the nth Heuserberg surface. And now, in, in 30 seconds, we can solve this problem. Uh, we start with the coupled angular momenta, the system we already know, a, a semi-torque family, in fact. We do a blow up on that family, and then we do a blow down on that family. And now we have something with the polygon we want on the first Heuserberg surface. Uh, and then we do a blow up of that family, and then we do a blow down of that family, and we have the polygon we want on the second Heuserberg surface. And then we continue, and we get the polygon we want on the, the third Heuserberg surface. And so the idea is that um, a semi torque system which is minimal of type 3, so that type 3 minimal system, exists on the k plus first Heuserberg surface, and it's not quite explicit. I don't have formulas written down, which is sort of unfortunate. Um, but it's unclear if there's formulas like this even exist. I mean, we, we I mean, worked for a year trying to write them down. Um, but, uh, but it's sort of explicit in the sense that you, know, you, you understand that you start with the coupled angular momentum, you do blow-ups and blow-downs away from the focus-focus fiber. So sort of what's going on near the focus-focus fiber should be the same. Um, so this almost solves my problem. And in fact, I guess I can, uh, I can spend two minutes and solve my last problem, uh, which is that we have one more system I want to find, the, the minimal system of type, um, of type 2. And, and this is a nice system. It, it's really interesting um, because it has two focus focus points. And this, this twisting index invariant, which is sort of the most mysterious invariant that I mentioned earlier, uh, can really be understood in terms of how these focus focus points, how the Lagrangian vibration nearby them sits relative to each other. So it's nice if you have an explicit example with two focus focus points. Uh, and now this is the last time I'll have you think about the coupled angular momenta, which is we look at the coupled angular momenta, and we think it would be really great if not only could we bring in the first point, but we could also bring in the second point. And then we would have exactly this polygon, and everything would be fine. And um, well, and, and essentially, this is what we did. I, I mean, I can tell you exactly what I did, which is that we generalized h as much as we could. H, this is like the h from the coupled angular momenta, except I added in a new term with z2, because I want the, the point on the second sphere to be going inside. This sort of makes sense. And it turns out you can uncouple the, um, I don't know, the, the sort of h, the, the second part of the Hamiltonian. And then what I did is I just put this in my computer, and I made it check millions of Hessians to see if any of them looked like they were focus focus. And this is not a very satisfying answer, but I'll have a satisfying answer before the end. Um, but then my computer indicated to me that, that um, if I took parameters a quarter, a quarter, a half, zero, then this should be, um, this should be a semi torque system with two focus focus points. And I didn't really trust my computer, so I did a bunch of calculations. It turns out my computer was, was right, so, so everything's verified. Um, and this, I mean, this really solves the problem. But it doesn't write the system as a semi torque family in terms of parameters and in terms of transitions, which is what I like to do. Um, and so uh, what I'm going to do is define now four Hamiltonian, uh, different Hamiltonians. Um, you know, the, the dot product, z1, z2, and this, I don't know, dot product, but with a minus. And I can write a new Hamiltonian that has two parameters that is a convex combination of convex combinations of these four things, um, such that the system that I cared about from the theorem a second ago is sort of the central system, the one-half, one-half system in this, in this um, yeah, I don't know, convex combination of convex combinations. Uh, and then I can draw two pictures, and then the talk will be over. So the first picture is that if you started with a minimal system of type 2, the four polygons should look like this. Because we have two focus focus points, we have up, 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 down, down, up, and down, down. So you have all these cuts we can do. Um, and now what I can do is take you know, this h that depends on two parameters, a convex combination of convex combinations, and I can just draw the momentum map. Um, if I have uh, 0, 0, I get the toric system. If I let s1 increase, I get the coupled angular momenta system, if I just leave s2 at 0. If I let leave s1 at 0 and let s2 increase, I get sort of this other way coupled angular momenta, where the other uh, point is the one that transitions. And then if I fill in all of the other things, uh, I get this, this picture that I really like, which is all of these transitions that are happening. Um, and, and right in the middle is this system, the 1 half 1 half system, which is a system we care about. So here in the middle is an example of the system that has, uh, uh, well, it, it's a system which is minimal of type 2. It has two focus focus points. And we can write it explicitly as a combination of, um, of systems that, that come from the polygons that, that this system has. You know, it's, it's sort of affine polygons. Um, OK, so I, I went three minutes over. And I apologize, but uh, the talk is over.